They've had sub, the Appropriations Committee has had sub, uh, subcommittee hearings where they're looking at individual parts of the budget. I am, I am proud to report that when it comes to things like uh, the Major Events Trust Fund, the Emerging, Emerging Technology Fund, these, uh, oh, these uh, special funds that the, uh, the governor has had over the years that do not fit within the core responsibility of state government have been given zero new dollars. Zero new dollars. Now, that was a bold thing on their part, and, and some of the members of those committees are already getting pressure from the governor's office. Uh, and, and, the, and the battle is not won yet on that front. You know, when the governor holds a, a veto pen, he, he's got some leverage. But uh, they're making some progress, folks. They're making some progress. I do expect that we will uh, fund enrollment growth in our public schools, which I think uh, is appropriate. Um, you can look at, we've got a ton, ton of people coming into the state every year. It is a responsibility of, it's a core responsibility of state government. And so I do expect that they will fund enrollment growth. Whether or not there will be any kind of a full restoration of the cuts uh, from previous budget cycle in education, I don't know. I don't know that the money is there to do that. The uh, big problems out there for funding are on transportation and water and, and how, you, how you fill the gaps. For, for a long time now, folks, we've been using debt to fund a big portion of our highway and road maintenance in this state. And the debt that we have, the debt availability to, to fund the roads is, is running out. And so now that's why you're hearing Senator L type, you're hearing others talk about new revenue. Where are we going to get new revenue to make up the shortfall? Uh, I, for one, am, am acknowledging that there's a problem. But my first instinct is to look at existing tax revenue and how we're using our money now before I enter into any kind of discussion about new tax revenue. Yeah. The fuel tax, as you've heard, has not been increased in over 20 years. So it stayed stagnant. It hasn't kept up with inflation or the cost of fuel. But other taxes around the state have gone up. Hundreds and hundreds of cities around the state have created what's called economic development corporations and charging their people a half cent on sales tax uh, purchases. And those monies have actually been piling up. Almost a billion dollars in 2011 was left sitting unspent and unencumbered in communities around the state. Almost a billion dollars. And I'm telling you, I have... I've just sort of uncut, been working on uncovering this little diamond in the rough of all this money sitting around there. And I've grabbed the attention of the governor's office, of the chairman of Ways and Means, uh, and other people. And we're working on a bill that's going to allow flexibility for those communities to use it on water and roads. Because right now, the law only pretty much allows them to use it for business development, economic development, things like sports venues, and giving money to businesses. That's not the best use of taxpayer money, in my opinion. So I'm going to give them another choice if my bill passes. To use it for a traditional purpose, which is roads and water infrastructure. And by the way, in my book, infrastructure is economic development. If you have good roads, you have good water, businesses are going to want to come and be in your community. And if you think a business is going to come and stay in your community for 20 years just because you gave them a little incentive up front, that's not the way businesses work. Businesses come here because you've got access to good highways, because you've got good schools, because they like the community, because you're in Texas. And uh, that's why they come. So uh, there's an argument to be made for, for economic development, and we can have a philosophical debate on that. But my first priority is to allow our taxpayer dollars to be used for a good government purpose. There are a ton of gun bills 
in Austin. People say, well, which ones are you signing? There are so many gun bills that the attorneys in the drafting offices have basically just kind of almost thrown up their hands. Everybody wants to get in on filing a gun bill. Um, and so I'm going to follow one, too. Uh, but uh, I, I've got some buddies that are doing some really good work on it. One of mine is it's a freshman. And let me tell you, the freshmen are filing bills that are interesting. Uh, he is a constitutional attorney from uh, Arlington, and uh, his name is Matt Krause. He's a dear friend of mine, and he's filed a bill that basically says this. Federal government, file all, create all the new laws and restrictions on magazines and guns you want. But, but the Supreme Court said in Prince versus U.S. in 1997 that the federal government cannot force the states to use your law enforcement people to implement a federal law. So feds, you want, you want to create a law, fine. We don't want you to, but if you do it, guess what? You're on your own. We're not going to be able to use our law enforcement. You're not going to be able to use our jails, our police officers, our DPS. You're on your own. So they're going to, and they don't have the resources. Do you think for a second the federal government has the resources on the ground to confiscate 30 round mags in all the homes around Texas? They, they don't. They bring the military in. They don't. And I've got friends in the military. I've got friends that are FBI agents. And they don't want to do that. And they're not going to do that. But this bill very clearly says it would be against the law for a police officer in Tyler, Texas to enforce a federal gun ban. Because the Supreme Court has already ruled, feds, if you make a law, you can't, you can't deputize all the law enforcement people in Texas to enforce your bad bill. And I'm very proud of that. And there's going to be, I, I do believe we're going to have some meaningful pushback against the feds on this issue uh, this session. Yeah, so that is good news. There's a major education reform bill that is pushing through the House uh, that's going to, to de-emphasize uh, some of the uh, pressure we're putting on, on standardized tests. It's going to give some more flexibility to our local schools, uh, and it's going to sort of open it up more to a, a, a more customizable degree plan so that career and technology can be re-emphasized. Um, I'm carrying a bill that's going to cut the red tape on how we hire our career and technology teachers in our schools. Right now, if you're a retired engineer that wants to come teach auto shop to some 15-year-old knuckleheads who, who aren't behaving in class, and you want to get them inspired to learn something different, I call that applied physics, yeah. by the way. Well, if you walk up to the superintendent, he's going to go through all these state laws. He's going to take you a year to two years, $3,500 to $5,500 to go get a permission slip from Austin. And oh, by the way, the bureaucrats in Austin may just disapprove it. In fact, we pulled data and found that over the last two years, they've been kicking back over 25% of, of these teachers that the schools have been trying to hire. The superintendent actually signs affirming under oath that this person is qualified. And a bureaucrat in Austin has been saying, no, we don't think so. So my bill says, superintendent, you decide. You decide whether the person's qualified. And if we want subject matter experts from our community to come into our high schools to teach young people how to work and have a career, we can do that stay out of our business. Yeah. And let me tell you, uh, I've been working every member of the Public Education Committee, and I've had two senior members sign on as joint authors. The first one's a Democrat, uh, and the second one's John Davis, and, and so I'm very hopeful that we're not only going to get a hearing, but we've got good support. Dallas Independent School District saw the bill, came in, and said, we love it. The, and they swing a pretty big stick down there. There's members in the House that have uh, students in Dallas ISD, so we've got some good support. Our local superintendents are supporting it. Uh, and I'm hopeful it's going to pass. Uh, the very first bill I filed, I'll get to you in just a second, Dr. King. The very first bill I filed as a member of the legislature was something that I think is near and dear to me and ought to be to every one of you. 
And that is to continue to tell the story of, of the losses, of the lost lives that we have in the state to abortion. We have a state demographer in Texas. His job is to analyze the socioeconomic impact of the people in Texas. And I sat through all these briefings. His reports go to the schools. They go to TxDOT. They go all over the state. And I'm sitting there thinking, we're killing all these children. And nobody's telling the story from the state government perspective. And so we filed a bill that's going to require the state demographer to do a report each year on the socioeconomic impact uh, to our state economy from the lives that are lost. There's only two ways an economy grows. Dr. Kane, tell me if I'm wrong. Increased productivity or an increase in the number of working age adults. That's the only two ways an economy can. He's nodding his head yes, so I want to give you. There's, that's the only two ways. If you, are, if you are decreasing the number of working age adults by aborting babies, that hits our pocketbooks. That hits the state's pocketbooks. We need to tell that story, and I'm hoping, uh, hoping that that bill will pass. <coughs> Taking some questions now. This is supposed to be a town hall, and I've talked for 15 minutes. So uh, I have a microphone if you need it. All right, Dr. Kane. Now back to the engineer that wanted to be a shop teacher. I understand that example. What about the example of the retired Exxon chemist who wants to teach chemistry? Would he be able to do so solely on the basis of the approval of the superintendent? Well, uh, we have limited, uh, for the sake of practicality, we've had to limit our bill to career and technology teachers because uh, this is, a, this is an initial step. If you go after all the classroom teachers, you probably can't get it done right now because the unions uh, will probably kill it right off the bat. So I wanted to make some progress. Now, the devil's in the details. If the superintendent can argue that this chemist is teaching a career in technology class, then I would say yes. But <laughs> better to ask forgiveness than permission, right? So, sometimes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar. Is that Steve Toth's bill? Okay, Steve Toth's also a, a, a good friend of mine. And uh, C-Scope has gotten a, a pretty thorough uh, examination by the Senate Education Committee. Uh, he, here's my uh, thing about C-Scope. I've seen some of the lessons, and they made me sick. Okay? And I just want to be careful that because we have seen some problems with Cisco, that we don't do something that also pulls in all the other school districts who are using their own customized curriculum, like Bullard and White House, who weren't using Cisco, that we don't uh, craft a bill that pulls more authority to Austin. Okay? Cisco, whether or not a school uses Cisco, is a local decision, right? And so I want to be careful as a legislator in Austin to say, I don't want to have a bad reaction to something and say, oh, because that was bad, I'm pulling more authority down to Austin. Okay? So I want the problem to be solved and addressed at the local level. So I know where Steve's toth is going with that, and I've got to look more carefully at the bill to see what it does. I do want there to be more scrutiny on C-Scope. But at the same time, I don't want to take all the other schools and all of a sudden have all their curriculum uh, be brought into some more authority in Austin, which we may not need. So um, that's a long-winded answer to a simple question. But we are giving you a lot of scrutiny. I heard a state board of education member call Cisco Enron, and uh, I'm Edron. wondering if it's going to take you some years before you find out what Cisco really is. Well, I think in other words, it's not a curriculum, it's not a plan, it's not a template, it's none of the above. And what is it? Nobody knows. 
And so uh, I really, I think this is exactly Enron. And a uh, uh, person who's used it for six years uh, says it's Enron. And I, I don't think the State Board of Education um, is wrong. And I don't think you guys are going to get a hold of it anytime soon, just from a few hours of meetings. 